All right. Well, with that, I guess uh, I guess we'll get started. So, thank you for joining us for uh, yet another webinar webinar in the Plant Phenome Journal monthly webinar series. Um, I'm Seth Murray. I'm an associate professor at Texas A&M and uh, the editor of the Plant Phenome Journal and run this webinar. Um, and actually, this, this week, it's fairly unique. It's uh, one of my students, Stephen Anderson, who um, has uh, recently had his paper accepted. Full disclosure, I did not handle the article in any way, shape, or form. Um, our other associate editor, Carolyn Lawrence, did. Um, and uh, he is going to be speaking today on the prediction of maize grain yield before maturity using impo uh, improved temporal height estimates of unmanned aerial systems. After the conclusion of his webinar, uh, there will be some time for questions and answers. So if you want to type your question into the chat box, or I'll provide some opportunities that you can uh, ask your question um, over the over the web. So um, with no further ado, uh, graduate students in the corn breeding program here at Texas A&M, Stephen Anderson. All right, thanks, Seth. Uh, is my audio coming through well? Sounds good. Okay, cool. So uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today to uh, listen to my presentation on our recent uh, publication in the Plant Phenome Journal. So uh, to get started, I'm just going to introduce uh, maize production in Texas. So uh, this is as of 2017, we've plant, we plant about 2.45 million acres of corn in te Texas and we average about 140 bushels per acre. Uh, this is about 314 million bushels total for the state of Texas. And in the Texas Panhandle alone, which is this upper region here, it's about a $3.5 billion industry and, and provides about 22,000 jobs. Um, and of that industry, we export about $160 million worth of maize. Uh, and to put this into perspective, in Iowa, they have an average of about 200 bushels per acre and they produce 2.5 billion bushels, which is 18% of the nation's uh, production as of last year. So if we look at this moving uh, grain yield trend over the years, uh, we can see that the Midwest, which includes Iowa and Illinois and all those areas is uh, out producing Texas in grain uh, yield. And this is no surprise because they are putting more resources into improving varieties in those areas. But if we look at the irrigated land in Texas, we can see that it does very well and it has been increasing uh, linearly over time. One of our major issues is in our non-irrigated land, which is the majority of Texas uh, maize production has stayed pretty much stagnant. We haven't seen any real improvement. So if we can improve the our, our grain yield in our dry land environments while maintaining our increase in the irrigated land, we should be able to effectively increase the Texas uh, trend. So the way we judge this in, in breeding specifically is through genetic gain or what we call the breeder's equation. So R is the gain over time. And the ways we can uh, increase this are by increasing our selection intensity. Uh, and this specifically means by growing and phenotyping more plants. Uh, we can increase our selection accuracy. So this means we phenotype better and we measure our traits better. Um, we can increase our genetic variance. So we can either use more diversity or we can better capture the diversity within our uh, already established populations. And this is all relative to how quickly we can do that. So the more generations we can advance per year, the faster we can see gains in, in our genetics. So when it comes to uh, remote sensing and unmanned aerial systems, the three areas that this really targets are the selection intensity. We can, we can look at more plants with less inputs. Uh, we can possibly measure plants better with less human error and bias. And we, we, we hypothesize that you can actually capture more genetic variants and then, because it's not all being put into error or other factors. And the UAVs don't really have an effect on increasing the generations per year. So specifically this work is uh, focused on plant height because in Texas specifically plant height is highly correlated to grain yield and could be used as an indirect selection phenotype for grain yield. 
So there is this 10 year uh, study across Texas performance trials, uh, 16 environments, four replicas for environment, and 10 years of data. And we see that this has a roughly 60% correlation to grain yield across the entire state of, state of Texas. And in our area specifically, it's about a 46% correlation to grain yield. This was again validated in a uh, test cross population that we developed, that Dr. Chen developed recently. And she showed that, again, we have very high correlations to grain yield with plant height and flag leaf height in both dry land and irrigated environments. So one of the reasons we're looking at uh, phenotypes is specifically we have this issue with phenomic bottlenecking where we have all this accumulated massive genomic data, but with these complex quantitative traits such as plant height, we aren't really able to elucidate anything out in terms of genetic information that is leading to improvements. So we're looking towards just using the phenotypes directly instead of going into the, the genetic markers to make selections based on these indirect selections based on height rather than uh, marker uh, selections. So this was, uh, we did a comparison study, and, and this is what we're going to talk about mostly here today, where we flew two different uh, UAV platforms. So a UAV is the actual aircraft, and then when we add sensors such as cameras or multispectral cameras, that's when it becomes an unmanned aerial system. So we flew the Tufwing UAV mapper, uh, which is a fixed-wing aircraft. It flew at an altitude of 120 meters with, and resulted in about a two centimeter uh, resolution per pixel. And on this platform, we flew the Sony A6000 RGB camera. Uh, we also flew a rotary wing aircraft, the DJI Phantom 3. Uh, we flew this at an altitude of 20 meters and the resolution was about one centimeter per pixel. And we used the onboard uh, stock camera that comes with that platform. So the steps to obtaining height through uh, using UAS uh, has multiple steps. So first you have to go out to the field and you place ground control points. Uh, you take GPS coordinates on those, and this allows you to then stitch your images together and have them in the proper uh, place on the earth. And when you look at multiple time points throughout the growing season, they all line up in the same position. Uh, once we have our ground control points in place, we fly the UAS and we collect images. And each one of these images has GPS coordinates and an IMU tag. We then uh, put all this information into an image processing software, such as PIX4D or PhotoScan. And we it does several steps to process the images, including identifying key points, calibrating the images, optimizing camera parameters, and again, georeferencing and matching the images so they all line up from flight to flight. The output from this is we get three main uh, outputs. We get a structure from motion three-dimensional point cloud, which is a, has X, Y, and Z coordinates, which gives us structural information. And we also get ortho mosaics and digital surface models. So specifically today, we're going to focus on using the uh, structure from motion uh, point clouds, because this is how we are extracting our height estimates. And the majority of my research is focused on this purple box in which to extract height estimates, what we do is we have to identify the ground from the point cloud, and then we have to take the difference between the ground and the rest of the points to get an adjusted height above ground. We then have to identify individual plots within the entire field so that we can extract plot level data and then we do some statistical analysis to find the things like the, geno the genotypic value, I mean, sorry, the genetic values, and we can also measure repeatability and do prediction modeling. So uh, before, I'm going to talk about a few sections today. So one of the main focuses of this study at the beginning was to develop a uh, the processing pipeline to extract the height estimates. And one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure we were extracting the highest quality height estimates we could. And one of the main ways to do that is we have to model the ground effectively in order to uh, take the difference between the, height, the, the ground and the, the plant height. 
So this is a visual representation of what we're, what we're what I'm talking about. So in our fields, we do furrow irrigation where we have hills and furrows. Uh, as for our irrigation purposes, we run water down these furrows. And what we have to do is we have to, if we look at the point cloud in general, and this blue line would incorporate all of these data points, but we need to identify the uh, brown points and then again identify the tops of the hills because our plant heights are not from the bottom of the furrows, they're from the top of the hill to the tip of the tassel. So once we identify our desired uh, ground points, we can then create a digital surface model and do the, the difference between the digital surface model, which is the blue line, and the digital elevation model, which is the red line, which gives us height estimates at every point in the point, in the point cloud. So to put this, to make this a little more sense, if this is our phenotype, our manual phenotype here, we take the measurement with a stick from the ground to the tip of the tassel, and that's what we call plant height. When we get out uh, plant material from the point cloud, which is in green here, it's a bunch of points that are just kind of a, a bunch of data there. And we take the distribution and we take percentiles from that distribution to estimate height. So for example, the blue line would be the 90th percentile, 95 in green, 99 and max in red. And this is how we estimate height from uh, plot level point clouds. And just as an example, we get extreme, we're getting really fairly high correlations between manual and estimated height values. So there's two ways that our, uh, the ground is commonly modeled for uh, extracting heights, and the most common one is called the difference-based method. So basically what you do is you take your in-season flights and you subtract the uh, pre- or post-season bare earth uh, point cloud from that, from the, from your, your in-season flight, which gives you your above ground uh, height estimates or your crop surface, canopy surface model. There's also this approach where we, we can identify the ground from within each point cloud individually, which is called the point cloud method. And we wanted to evaluate the difference based method compared to the three most common and publicly available algorithms for identifying the ground within an individual uh, flight. So there's the hierarchical robust interpolation, the adaptive triangulated irregular network, and the cloth surface model simulation filter, sorry. Uh, so the HRI works uh, in a way where it goes from the top down and it iteratively creates an intermediate surface until it, until it converges on what it, what it believes the ground is based on your, uh, your parameters that you set. Now the A10 method works in a different way where it works from the bottom up and it identifies minimum value points and it creates these triangular networks and you set thresholds to determine if points above the, the known points are ground or not ground. And then a cloth simulation filter uh, takes the entire point cloud, it inverts it, and then lays this cloth, cloth mesh on the bottom surface and uses uh, several uh, parameters to uh, fit the mesh to the bottom of the point cloud. So, we looked at specifically three study sites to evaluate these four uh, different methods of, of modeling the, the elevation or the surface, sorry. Uh, we did a low canopy density hybrid study site, which is a hybrid trial. The canopy density is low. There's a lot of ground representation and the plants are young. It's about 33 days after planting. We have a high canopy density hybrid trial where the canopy density is filled in. There's lower, uh, low ground representation and the plants are at relative maturity around 57 to 60 days. We also put in a moderate canopy density inbred trial, which is inbred germplasm for comparison. And also the de canopy density in the inbreds doesn't tend to close completely like it does in the hybrids. So we have a moderate level of ground representation even during uh, late vegetative growth. So well, that, uh, this is the uh, figure of the absolute errors. So the difference between the estimates and the, 
the absolute value between the difference of the estimates and the manually measured plant heights. Uh, we have the fixed wing in this column and the rotary wing in this column. And then we have low density, medium density, and high density. And then our four methods of the HRI, HRI the ATIN, crop, the cloth simulation filter, and then the difference based method. And what we can see here is that uh, in most of these cases, that the higher the percentile you use, the better your estimates are. But there are um, drawbacks to this because in some cases, specifically at the lower uh, the lower flight altitudes, we're getting, we get a lot more noise in the data. And we can actually see that the, the opposite occurs is that once you pass the 95, which is the green, sorry, the, the legend is not here. This is the 90th percentile in blue, 95 in green, purple is 99, and orange is max. So as you as you progress specifically uh, in this case here, the the P95 is where you see the best uh, the least error between the measurements, and then it actually progressively gets larger and larger as you go uh, higher up in the percentiles. So uh, for, from this perspective, it's probably better to stick with uh, one of the lower percentiles and not go with the max, because the max could incorporate a lot of outliers that are hard to remove from some of the data sets, which will bias your, your errors. And their errors can be upwards of a meter in, in error. So this is the exactly the bias that we're talking about. Uh, so this is the same graph, except with without being the absolute values. It's just the difference in um, the manual measurement minus the the UAS estimate. So if the violin plots are above the red line, that means that the UAS estimates are lower. So there's a they're shorter than the than the manual measurements, and if they're below the line, they're higher than the manual measurements. So again, we can see here that as we move through the through the canopy structures and the low canopy, again, we have this issue of uh, as we get higher in the the percentiles, we get overestimates of height, um, and this continues in trend. And we see it again that in the high canopy, that specifically for the rotary wing, that we see. Uh, we see overestimates of height. In the fixed wing, we don't see this issue as much. Uh, we see because because of the lower resolution, we believe that it's consistently underestimating height um, because it, because of the way that the structure promotion algorithm works and matches points. So one final step that we wanted to look at is the genetic variance and how repeatable these measurements are across these different um, these different ground filtering methods. So again, this is the same graph with the canopy densities and the methods. We just have genetic variance here and repeatability. And this is where we really uh, defined which method we wanted to use. The other methods show that they all generally have similar errors and there isn't uh, much difference in the 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 absolute and relative and biased of the measurements, but we we do see is that uh, when we use the the HRI method compared to a lot of these other methods, it's consistent. So it's consistently performing uh, better than the other two uh, point cloud based methods. And in some cases, the digital, the, the difference based method does do better. But in the majority of the cases, it's uh, the HRI is better or out or consistent with the difference based method. And the reason for this is because we believe that there is still some shifting uh, in the georeferencing, specifically of like of the, ele the overall elevation of the point clouds. So if you don't get a, a really good modeling at the early season uh, flight, you may be continually biasing your your estimates, and, and in some cases, as you can see here, and for the rotary wing, we get uh, large drop-offs in our 
in our variance compared to what the ground truth is in red. So, and, and then here we can see that here. So the the HRI is consistent. It it stays better or equivalent to the uh, ground truth methods. And we also see that the uh, P95 and the P99 are are the P90 are tend to be higher in repeatability and genetic variance as well. So we we would choose those parameters to use as estimates rather than the higher uh, percentiles because they may be you may be losing some of your genetic information in, in that sense, your genetic variance information in that sense. So we we want to dive into this a little further and look at the 95th percentile using the hierarchical robust interpolation method. And there's the fixed wing, the rotary copter, and the ground truth. And these are the variance components of those three uh, methods. And then in those different canopy structures. And uh, the comparison here I really want to make is between the ground truth and the other two. Well, what we're seeing in, in the UAS is that we can we are increasing the variance of the genotypes, and we're also partitioning variants into the uh, the spatial components more than we do in the uh, the manual measurements in the field. So this is what's driving our repeatability and what's driving our our higher estimates in those previous graphs. So this is this is indicating to us that the UAS is uh, is doing a better job of um, surveying the field and not having and capturing the spatial variation better than we can with manual measurements. So uh, I'm going to run back to the pipeline now. So we now that we've decided that we're going to use the P95 height estimate and we're using the hierarchical robust interpolation ground filter, we wanted to put the whole pipeline together and uh, implement it into a, a, a bigger study. So again, here's our, uh, our data processing pipeline. And now we've identified how we're going to uh, identify the ground and we're going to use a specific percentile to extract height estimates. So the first thing we have to do though when we do this is, is we have to we have to look at our data because unfortunately the data is not always reliable and we do see a lot of uh, flights where we get these anomalies or these what are called noise and blunders and artifacts where we either get uh, very weird deviations from the from the common trend of data where the elevations have been skewed in the negative direction and this can be seen here and here and we also get these sometimes these very strange uh, point clouds where we have major artifacts above and below the data and again we uh, consistently have to struggle with negative and uh, blunders below or noise below the point clouds which this is the common thing in structure from motion data that uh, you have to be aware of. And a point here is that this isn't, I think, one of the main reasons why the A10 and the CSF models did not perform as well as the HRI model, because they work from the graph from the bottom up. And if you have negative blunders below your parameters of inclusion, it will never work its way up. The algorithms won't work their way up and uh, be able to make it to the actual ground surface. So this is why the HRI works so well, as it, it takes the average uh, surface and it iteratively works its way down until it finds a, a convergence point. And this is another example of why the difference space method doesn't work as well, too, because if you rely on one uh, early season flight to identify your ground, say for this one, but your consistent ground is like this, uh, you're going to inflate your heights up, you know, several meters. So uh, by by identifying the ground within each point cloud, it doesn't matter where the elevation is estimated because it will adjust based on that specific point cloud rather than relying on another point cloud. Okay, so 
this is the over uh, uh, simplistic overview of how this works. You have your original point cloud, which we would call the digital surface model. Uh, we identify the ground points and we create a digital terrain model from that. Then we take the difference of the two and we get what is called a crop surface model, which is the above ground height estimates of our maze plots, which is a, here's a visual representation of that. Um, the next step is we have to extract all of these uh, individual plot estimates. So we've developed this tool uh, that we're calling UAS tools, which will hopefully soon have more uh, functionality to it. But the main tool in it right now is the creation of plot level uh, ESRI shape files. So you have to give a few things to the model, I mean, to the function. Uh, you give it an A and B coordinate and it creates the A to B line. This A to B line tells the function where to start creating plots and then it will follow your experimental design and create uh, pl plot level shape files in the orientation of the field already rotated. And you also can set the total plot length, the buffer zone, and also the uh, row spacing. So if you're interested in using this, it's a freely available on GitHub. Um, just search for UAS tools and I'll have another link for it at the end of the talk for you guys to, to reference. Okay, so we have this, our pipeline is working, everything, we're, we're now in this point where we can go through and process all of our flights and we're pretty confident in, in our height estimates at this point. So we, we want to go back to this idea of comparing the two uh, platforms, the fixed wing and the rotary copter on a, a larger scale project. So we've been evaluating the genomes to field uh, hybrid trial in Texas uh, from 2017 up to this year, 2019 with the UAS. Um, and the genomes to field initiative is a huge collaborative initiative that has evaluated over 45,000 field, field plots, over 1,500 corn hybrids and across 77 unique environments in North America. So specifically in Texas, we're going to talk about the, the 2017 data, which was a randomized complete block, 250 hybrids, two reps per trial. And the we had three uh, different environments, which we like to call the early optimal planting irrigated optimal fertilized environment, the delayed planting irrigated optimal fertilized environment, and the optimal planted not irrigated and reduced fertilizer. Uh, environment. So we flew the, the the two platforms on these these trials throughout the entire growing season, uh, and we were shooting for a flight every uh, two weeks with the fixed wing. And during the early stages of growth, and uh, every week during the, the 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 early stages of growth with the with the rotary copter. And then we switched to uh, two flights per week when we when when we were which was two weeks before flowering. What we learned from this is that um, in order to effectively capture the growth, we collected a, a lot of data in an area where we don't really need as much data, um, and we needed to uh, collect data in this zone here where we see the the uh, exponential growth beginning. So if we compare the fixed wing to the rotary ring, we can see that the weekly flights allowed us to effectively uh, capture the growth curve of the maze growth. And these are the mean, this is the mean of the trial and the bar plots are the confidence interval. Um, and we can see in the fixed wing here that we actually didn't effectively, or we, we have very sparse data representation during this growth stage, and we have a lot of uh, repetitive data of the same information in a stage where we don't really need it. So what we learned from this is we need to fly more often earlier in the season, and we don't need as many flights post-flowering as we thought we did. So we also learned that this, this growth stage of logarithmic or exponential growth 
starts to occur a lot earlier than we expected. We're starting at uh, a 25 to 35 day uh, period. And that's when we really need to start flying at a, a more consistent rate and capturing data to effectively model the temporal growth of maize. So to compare these, the, the quality of these two uh, platforms, I'm going to focus on just the uh, the optimal planting irrigated trial, the highlighted in green. And I just did a visual representation of the temporal flight. Uh, and this is the entire field. And this is the fixed wing flights throughout the growing season. And what we see here is that the fixed wings data is, is consistent and follows the trend we would expect where uh, as the growing season uh, uh, progresses, the heights are getting taller and taller and we don't see any uh, major fluctuations in the trends. Uh, these, these taller areas of the field, which are, are taller genotypes, stay taller than this area, which is in green as we go through the season. And as the dry down begins to occur, we see uh, lower heights based on the key matching again. So in contrast, when we look at the rotary wing, uh, we see that we capture uh, more data earlier in the season, which is it's good because we're at lower resolution. So we're, we're seeing more structure. But one of the major issues we saw is that the consistency of the data was not as reliable. And we had these uh, major outliers and trends throughout the growing season. For example, 67 days, uh, 91 days, 118. So uh, from a qualitative perspective, the the higher flight uh, of the fixed wing resulted in more consistent, reliable data than the rotary wing did. And that's not to say that the rotary wing's data was not uh, informative. You just had to uh, work through these and identify these these flights of of bad information. So if we looked at these these growth curves again, what we see, what, as we just discussed, is the fixed wings grow and have fairly clean, consistent growth uh, patterns based on the estimates, but there still are some blips, but they're not as major as we, we see in these in the rotary wing where uh, we collect really informative data, but we also get these dates where we have spikes or, uh, or dips in the, the means, and we also get uh, shrinkage of the means to almost no variance in some of these flights. So this data set is still useful, but we have to have we have to go through it and identify these these flights and, and remove them before we use the data for uh, temporal our temporal data set as a whole. Uh, and the reason so one of the main reasons that these things are occurring is we hypothesize is that we have a lot of issues with uh, point matching in some cases, specifically at the lower altitudes. So because the and specifically later in the growing season, because the canopies become uh, very homogenous and they look extremely similar from uh, within a within a picture. It's just a bunch of green pixels. Uh, so at the lower uh, frame of reference of the the lower flights, we don't see as much of the field. So it's more difficult for the algorithm to identify and match these key points, which results in uh, mosaicing issues and for height it results in these what we call black holes where the algorithm just fails and it just it doesn't put it just leaves these areas empty or void of information um, and this is a visual representation of why this is occurring so as we go through the growing season and we do key point matching uh, we see that as we go through, we get to these areas where key points are just not matched and the algorithm fails. So flying higher is probably the most likely way to solve this issue. Okay, so let's talk about the variance components quickly. Um, so we, we did variance component decomposition of all of these flights, and we showed that uh, throughout time, the total variance, which is the red, I mean, the black circles does increase over time. So we get more genetic, we get more overall variance as we go through the growing season, which is expected. Uh, also, we see that the measurements are highly repeatable. So from uh, from replicate to replicate, the information is is consistent for the UAV 
for the UAS platforms. Again, we see that the, the repeatability is much more consistent for the, the tough wing than it is for the DJI. And again, that's because of the issues in stitching, we, we believe. So compared to, uh, to the, the manual plant height, which is the black bar, it's on average about 30% genetic variance in this trial. We see that if we look at the red bars, in many cases, our flights are actually capturing or partitioning more of the variance to genetic components than that we do with our, man, with our manual measurements, which means we are effectively capturing uh, more genetic variance, which is a good thing for driving genetic gain and making decisions. Now, the next question was, how do we use this data? Because this is, uh, you know, 20 flights across across three environments, and it's going to be very difficult to use all of these uh, flights together. So, uh, is there a way that we can condense the data down to less parameters for things such as prediction modeling? So, this the next part uh, of the study we wanted to look at using sigmoidal functions to uh, summarize the temporal data. And we looked at the yield, the yield correlations to these sigmoidal functions and the flights, and also looked at some indirect selection and prediction modeling. So one of the simplest ways to uh, model growth of maize is with the logistic function. And it uses three parameters, the inflection point, which is the halfway point between the growing season where the rate of growth is maximized. Uh, the asymptote, which is the top of the curve where it planes off, which is equivalent to terminal height at the end of the growing season, and the growth rate, which uh, is effectively the steepness of the curve and how quickly the curve reaches the asymptote. So we looked at the genetic variance of these, these what we call logistic parameters or functional parameters, and we saw a lot of these have uh, good genetic on genetic, uh, var the variants can be explained well by the genetics, so they're not just random variables that uh, are are caused by error and uh, spatial variation. So they are informative to us from a selection standpoint. Uh, one of the other very exciting things about using uh, the functional parameters or the, the logistic parameters is that they allow us to uh, do combined analysis across the growing season. So if we were to do this with um, the individual flights, it becomes very difficult to uh, combine a, or capture the perfect flight from season to season if we have a, a prediction model that where we want to say that, you know, flight 50 and flight 80 are the days we have to capture. So instead of doing that, if we can just capture the temporal growth and model it with these functional parameters, we can then do combined analysis of the um, of the data, and, and this allows us to use our temporal data across environments and across growing seasons, regardless of having to capture a specific flight date. And specifically, comparing this to manual measurements. What we see is that, again, we are driving our repeatability. Uh, we aren't necessarily capturing as much genetic variance, uh, but we are minimizing our residual variance by partitioning it into the environment and into uh, other spatial parameters, which is effectively giving us really good phenotypes for selection purposes. So if we, if we, we look at this in this in maize, what we're looking for is improving grain yield overall. Um, we want to look for things that are highly correlated to grain yield before we use them in prediction modeling. So grain yield is here on the, the, the first row, and we have plant height manual, uh, days to anthesis, days to silking, the functional parameters, and then the individual flight dates. What we see is that the as the growing season goes along, we actually don't see high correlation to grain yield with height estimates until we get near and uh, above flowering. Also, what we see is that these, uh, these functional parameters give us an insight of why this is occurring. So the faster the plant grows, 
the shorter the plant is and the less it yields. And effectively, uh, if we look at the inflection point, the the early the earlier the or the early seasons in uh, correlations to inflection point are negative, but they they transition to being positive at the later season, which indicates that the later the inflection point, the taller the plant, and the necess not necessarily the slower the rate of growth, but it, it's an extended rate of growth, which allows for uh, higher correlations to grain yield. So we hypothesize that plants that can uh, grow throughout the stresses of the Texas environment are able to put on more biomass and vegetative uh, material, which in, in some aspect is a biological reason behind increased grain yield. So when we looked at this, these are the correlations of the best flight and the parameters. We can see that compared to manual heights, we consistently improving our correlation to grain yield by using even a single uh, parameter by uh, 1, 1.5 fold, so which is about 150% increase. So the, the UAS estimates are improving our correlations to grain yield, which is good for predictive modeling. So if we actually develop these prediction uh, regressions, we did just simple stepwise regression to select the best parameters, um, which were either specific flights or the logistic parameters. We found we wanted to focus on the logistic parameters because they are consistent. They consist, the model says uh, asymptote and growth rate and inflection point are <laughs> significant, put them in the model. And every time you want to do the prediction, you just have to use those parameters. Whereas using individual flight dates, you have to say, the model is going to say, okay, you need flight date at 60 days and 120 days. And you have, and then if you want to reuse your model in the future, you have to get, go back and uh, essentially capture those specific uh, developmental stages to use your model. So the logistic parameters are more robust for prediction. And we see that compared to manual plant height, our our R squared goes from 8% to 34%. So this is a fourfold increase in prediction of grain yield using the logistic parameters from the UAS compared to the manual plant height alone that we tend to take in the field. And this correlates to a 50 to 100% 150% increase in selection accuracy. So if we look at which means that if you, if you select the top 10% in yielding hybrids, how many of those were the actual 10% uh, yielding hybrids uh, with uh, manual yield data? And again, we saw a 50 to 150% increase in that selection accuracy. So final thing just to point out again, the logistic parameters are moving the necessity to capture uh, specific informative flight dates and allow you to use your temporal growth as a whole, which leads to improvements in our indirect selection of grain yield, which we can implement in the future. Uh, one final slide here. This is just another uh, the predictions again. We can see that in comparison to that 8%, uh, if you do want to use individual flight dates and you select the best ones, again, you see a four-fold increase in prediction, but your ability to combine the data sets is much more difficult. And unless you're flying all of your fields on the same day, is very challenging. Um, and we saw no improvement by using the logistical parameters with individual flight dates. So you're better off using just the logistic parameters or just the flight dates for your prediction models. Um, and with that, I just want to say that all the data from this study is publicly available. So if anyone would like to use it, uh, we have all of the images and the UAS process data is on Cyverse. And with the publication coming out within the next week or two, with the final, the final edits, we should have the DOI in there. Uh, it's in the process of being released right now. And we also have the experimental designs, 
the manual measurements, the estimated phenotypes from the UAS, and all the logistical parameters are available on Dryad for anyone who would love to like to use them. And with that, I want to thank everyone involved, uh, specifically my funding through the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and the Tom Slick Fellowship, and also our NIFA AFRI Award for funding the majority of this research. And I will take any questions. Here again, here is the GitHub uh, if you'd like to use that function we created. Thank you. Well, thank you, Stephen, uh, for a great seminar and your really cutting edge area of using UAVs in uh, phenotyping of, of maize. So, we're going to open it up uh, for questions for the next uh, 10 minutes or so. And so, the best way to do that is potentially to write down in the chat. Or alternatively, to um, I'll just open it up so somebody can hop in and ask a question. Um, but if you ask it down in the chat, I'll read it aloud to, to uh, Stephen. So while you're thinking of what question you'd like to ask, I'll just make a plug too for the Plant Phenome Journal, uh, which is where this article is is currently available at, um, and hopefully it'll be finalized and published soon. But it's available in the uh, in the early uh, early look section. Um, and I guess one question for you, Stephen, uh, you covered a lot of stuff here. Uh, what did you find of all this work to be the most challenging of, of everything you did in terms of completing what you, uh, what you did? Um, yeah, so the, I think the most challenging aspect of working with this data is uh, learning how the, being comfortable with the data specifically. So. Uh, you spend a, I spent a lot of time processing, reprocessing, reanalyzing, um, and just learning common trends and how your data sets work is a critical step before you can move towards full automation of data extraction and, and you know, QC, QA, and things like that. So I feel like that is the, a bigger challenge than even the uh, the, the, the scripting or any of those things is uh, learning what's good data, what's bad data, uh, trying to find ways to identify those things, um, and just I guess management of the data sets is also a big thing because you're you're going from uh, huge image libraries to uh, file basically CSV files with billions of uh, lines of data and then you're you're compressing that down to 500 lines of data then you can compress it down to 200 so keeping that all stitched together is a, a a very difficult and tedious part of the work that needs to be further uh improved as we move along with this type of technology okay um, we have a question from uh, Dr. Dale Cope. Uh, is it feasible to use the GitHub app with 2019 UAS data? Uh, yeah, it's, so it's it's uh, completely. It's we've tried the soft program it as best as we can to uh, you use your your field. So it only it does only work for rectangular fields at the moment. Uh, we haven't really we don't work with circular fields uh, here. So that's one thing we can't address currently. But uh, as long as you have your experimental design, such as your rows and columns, and you give it the dimensions, it can it it will create the grid uh, of your of your input file. So whatever your your experiment is. So it, it's not based on a specific uh, trial. It's for anyone to use to create shape files for their field experiment, and it. Also, does not be, have to be specifically for corn. If you're working with wheat or cotton or something like that, that has uh, wider rows, or or you're doing strip trials or something like that, it, it can be accommodated to do all those things. Great. So, um, uh, Dr. Cope also uh, asked if it's possible to get a copy of the presentation, and um, I would assume it is. But also, uh, most of our plant phenome journal webinars, unless there's a technical difficulty. Um, I've recorded and they're on our YouTube site. So I plan on putting this up uh, in the next day or so. Uh, Scott Wilde says, great presentation. What would you say is the most important next steps for this work? 
yeah, so the I think one of the next steps would be to uh, so the genomes the field project is not necessarily uh, representative of the germplasm of our breeding program. So we do have entries in there, but it would be I think the next step would be to implement this into uh, our or into your specific uh, field breeding program and your hybrid trials to see if you can use it uh, to do indirect selection and, 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 and drive genetic gain. Um, also, we um, need to start working with uh, combining multiple years of data and multiple environments rather than uh, this is a, you know, a, a lar one of the larger scale studies, but it's still within one environment in one year or one not one location in one year. We have these several environments in there, but I had multiple multiple uh, years of data collection being combined uh, implementation into uh, germplasm that is relevant to the actual more relevant to the breeding program and also incorporating uh, additional traits. Um, I think that you know height is important, but we need to. It's not the end all be all. We're not we're not claiming that you should predict uh, grain yield based on height alone. Uh, it just could be one one of the informative uh, phenotypic indirect selection predictors in your model. Once, but you could include other things like from the spectral data sets, like NDVI and uh, possibly more advanced things such as structure, I mean, not structure, textural phenotypes and things we don't even know if they're, uh, their genetic basis is yet. Okay, great. Um, David Horn says the data stand thesis and data silking showed high correlations with yield and can be used as good predictors. But did you look at the anthesis silking model to see if it had higher correlations for grain yield predictions? I've noticed in the literature that in drought prone environments, the Anthesa silvia and Viral tend to have better predictability for grain yield. Yeah, so I didn't, uh, no, I didn't do the, AS, the ASI or the Anthesa silking interval. Um, that is, yeah, I think that's been shown. We've also done studies that show that uh, for some of our studies, it doesn't really find uh, major differences compared to using DTA and DTS. Um, but I think the this is just a hypothesis. I think that that when you use the logistical parameters, you're you're essentially incorporating uh, flowering time with height in your prediction model uh, by using inflection point and growth rate. Uh, so that that might be the reason one of the major reasons why it's driving the the prediction accuracy is that it's it's a uh, Again, maybe an indirect uh, prediction that includes uh, something that's highly correlated because it is. Uh, I'll go back really quick and shift into the. Um, if you look at flowering time, it is fairly uh, high correlation to inflection point, and it is highly negatively correlated to growth rate. So these things combined, it's it's likely that using the functional parameters where predicting grain yield as a function of flowering time and and uh, terminal height in combination. I gotta un I gotta unmute myself here. Um, so uh, Shane Simpson asks, can you please explain how to use Cybers and Dryad? Or at least maybe just Cybers, what applications or tools did you use? Um, so we don't actually use any, I don't use any, we didn't use any applications in Dryad, I mean, in, in Cyverse yet. Uh, we're in collaboration with and discussing possible features to be built for processing. Um, we're basically using it as a data repos repository right now for our uh, expansive uh, image data sets, which I think that this year alone is roughly uh, half a terabyte in data. So, uh, and Dryad is the same thing. Dryad, we're just using it as a data repository for the large phenotypic phenotyping data sets. But 
I know that Cybers is uh, working diligently to to figure out ways to incorporate tools in their in their infrastructure for these important areas of drone research and uh, prediction modeling and things like that. Okay, great. Um, I got one last question uh, listed here, oh, um, and uh, Shay Simpson said thank you. Uh, next question is from uh, Jinha Jung. Great presentation. A couple of questions. Actually, he's got a number of questions here. Um, have you compared 3D point clouds from multispectral versus RGB? Based on his experience, 3D clouds from multispectral is more stable uh, than RGB because of the global shutter versus the rolling shutter. Uh, short answer, no. Um, that'd be interesting to look at. I don't think I have. I haven't looked at that because because the um, yeah, that would be an interesting next step. But to maybe in, to look at. But we just did the comparison of RGB because the DJI didn't collect the multispectral. Um, it might nest. I'm not sure though because it might also since the resolution is is in general lower on the multispectral. It might also be uh, eliminating a lot of the variance or informative data because of the I think it's five centimeter resolution rather than even two. So we might be losing a lot of information that way. But it would be interesting to look at. Um. Similarly, he asked, uh, or, or continuously, he asked, uh, when you extract canopy height from 3D point clouds, have you considered dividing the plot into smaller plots so that you'll have multiple canopy height measurements within the plot? Um, that might help remove noisy data. Uh, yes, we could do that. It just adds an extra, uh, again, an extra step to the process. But yeah, that's definitely a possibility. I think one of the one of the major issues with the noise though is is that there's just uh I mean it will definitely especially if there's gaps in the canopy that may cause an issue in the distribution but um I think the the noise is really just a fact of like artifacts that we I, I, okay, I guess I understand what you're saying because then you could just throw out that subsection and continue with your analysis. But yeah, that we have we have not looked at that. I know, I know Jinha is working with that, but yeah, that's something that if it could easily be, it should be easily implemented. But it's just another step that we didn't, we haven't worked on yet. Okay, that was the last question I've listed. Um, last chance if anybody would like to ask a question verbally. Uh, uh, can I do that? Sure. Thank you, Steve. Uh, this is Gina. Uh, I'm really excited about your presentation because you made uh, so much progress, you know, the, within you know such a short period of time. And um, I know that uh, this you know structure from motion data set is giving us sometimes kind of noise data set because of you know the wind conditions, so many other you know the factors. But uh, the, based on the fact that you're primarily interested in you know, height information. I believe you know LIDAR is going to give you the you know best you know data set to extract the height. So, do you have any kind of you know plans or insight on like you know, incorporating any LIDAR data set in your you know into your analysis in the future? Yes, yeah, so that's a. I think that's a <clears throat> a great question. Um, I know that we've been working on uh, LIDAR for or trying to get it. You know, working properly and getting good data back, and it's just been a a long and difficult process to get it implemented. But uh, I think the future of height estimates are going to possibly need to be moved towards something like lidar or uh, direct. Uh, I'm I'm blanking on the word right now, but where where we have the multiple cameras taking the same picture at the same time where where that be where that be a a drone with cameras two cameras attached to it or multiple drones flying in sync synchrony together uh because the having relying on the algorithms currently to identify these points and match them together is proving to be difficult and 
Um, I don't necessarily know if, when that's going to become, or if, you know, if flying higher is going to necessarily solve the issue in all cases. Um, but yeah, LIDAR, I think is a great opportunity. And I think it's uh, starting to emerge more and more now. And it's finally gotten, I think the technology is getting figured out uh, and it's being implemented in UAS right now. It's just LIDAR is uh, a big, um, you know, money input. So it might be hard to convince people to invest in LIDAR if structure promotion is working, uh, rel you know, eff pretty effectively. Okay, uh, one last one last question, and then we'll end it. Um, from Dr. Cook, any investigation on weather condition, wind speed impact on plant height measurements? Good question. Uh, no, not yet. Um, I'm I'm sure it's affecting it uh, because again, uh, any any small shift in the leaves from one picture to the next is going to affect the mosaicing and the key point matching. So I'm sure uh, some of our data sets that have failed are a result of also environmental factors, but um, we do have the weather data um, for G2F has weather data attached to it too. So if someone's interested in looking at that, that could be a very interesting area, but I my Hypothesis is yes, it, it most likely is, but I we've not, not done any research on it yet. Hey Seth, this is Alex. Hi Alex. Hey, just a quick response, Dale. I don't know if you uh, were watching uh, Dr. Hahn's presentation in the UAS workshop a couple of months ago, but uh, we published a paper on plant height measurement and sorghum recently, and there were really clear relationships between the error that we were seeing and the wind speed. And I can share that paper with anybody who wants it, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a pretty big factor. Thanks, Alex. Uh, yeah, I would like to get a copy of that. Okay. Okay, seeing as we're afternoon at this point, um, let's thank Stephen for an excellent job, and um, we can look forward to uh, about uh, a workshop that she led uh, at the webinar for next month. So thank you all for joining, and we will see you in the future. Thank you. Thanks.